spoke to us about recent developments on the recent volatility of the Ivanov, which remembers me a uh, nice paper I read some time ago, long time ago, which you all want to know about volatility, but not all that can be said. And I hope you will say a little bit more to us today. About that paper? <laughs> Uh, yeah, my name is uh, John Hyatt. I actually started in uh, research and product. Is this on? I actually started in uh, at CBOE in uh, research and product development in 1997. So about four years after we launched the original mix, which was based on at the money options in the OEX. Um, and the first thing that they asked me to work on was the idea of what do we do with the mix. Uh, with the declining OEX options volume, what should we do? Should we change it to the SPX? Should the formula stay the same? Should it look different? Uh, so that was the first project really that I worked on was uh, going around to a bunch of the banks and other market participants and asking them their thoughts on what we should do with the VIX. Uh, the, the one that probably gave us the greatest feedback was uh, a group of guys from Goldman Sachs. And that was the paper that you were actually talking about more than you ever wanted to know about variant swaps from uh, Araj Khani and Emmanuel Thurman. Um, there were two guys in particular, Sandy Rattray and Devesh Shaw, who uh, had some very specific suggestions for us about what we should do. Uh, and they, they agreed with the change to the SPX, but they also uh, suggested something that we weren't familiar with at the time at all. And it was the idea of actually using the VIX uh, as an indicator of the price of a fair variance or uh, the value of a variance swap. And they gave us a formula that didn't look anything like black shoals and implied volatilities. It was a weighted average of option prices for the out of money puts and calls. Um, and it, it was the first time I'd ever seen anything like that besides uh, Emmanuel's paper. So it took us a while to get familiar with it. But I'll talk a little bit about how we got from 1990. To, to the change that we made in 2003 and um, give you a little bit of intuition about the, the formula that we use now to calculate the VIX. Uh, obviously, you know, the VIX has become a very pop, popular trading tool. I think that I agree with Marcello when he was saying that, that, that since the VIX itself is not tradable, it's not really, it, it shouldn't be really thought of as something that you hold long term. You wouldn't buy a, a VIX future and roll it for a year and expect to have a good performance because of this idea of contagion. Um, so there are characteristics of, of the index itself that lend itself, uh, that, that lend it to, to being interesting to people for as an investment product or a trading tool. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, obviously, since you can't trade the VIX, it's not, not an asset that's uh, investable. There are products that have been built to trade it, um, and they all uh, basically uh, stem from the VIX futures product. Um, and there are ETFs that, that <coughs> have different strategies with, with, with VIX futures and the cash sale options. Uh, the first one that came out and worked with a, a group that uh, was at that point Lehman to develop an index that they could do uh, an exchange traded note on that eventually became the VXX. And I'll talk a little bit about about how that came along. Uh, later on, uh, I'll talk about the liquidity in the VIX products that we see today and how it's grown over time and how the, the development of those ETNs and exchange traded funds on the VIX that use the VIX future have driven just a unbelievable growth since 2009 in terms of the VEG exposure traded daily through VIX futures in the open interest. And, uh, I work at the exchange, so I really don't talk a lot about how people use the products. I can give you general ideas of what we see, um, but I really can't say you know, these are specific strategies to do. Um, jump right into the history of it. Um, the original VIX was launched in 1993, and it was done in coordination with a professor who at the time was at Duke University, his name was Bob Whaley. And what he did for us was he, he took the uh, OEX options, which at the time were the most liquid uh, index options that we were trading at the CBOE, and he made uh, uh, at the money implied volatility by interpolating between uh, an out of money call and an out of money put. 
and he did that for two different maturities and came up with a constant 30 day uh, money implied volatility. Um, obviously, that was a model dependent implied volatility, and since OEX options were at the time you know, our American style exercise, we didn't have the XDO at the time. We were using a binomial option pricing model to come up with our implied volatility. Um, between 1993 and 2003, when we made the change to the VIX, there were two attempts that I can recall uh, to trade a listed derivative product on volatility. One was actually done in Germany at Deutsche Terminbors, where they were had a very an index very similar to our VIX, where it was an active money index based on, on DAX options. And they listed a future on that product, and it traded for a little bit less than a year and didn't garner very much volume, and was delisted. There was a second product that came out on OMLX, which was actually a realized volatility futures product. And that one met with even less success than, than, than the VDEX. So in 2003, those were the two products that we had as uh, guinea pigs for what we were planning to do with our VIX. Um, the, the main reason that we went in 2003 to change the methodology was simply to change it to the SPX because of the volumes that we were seeing in OEX and SPX and the, the growth of SPX options. Uh, and when we actually talked to, to Goldman Sachs and they brought the formula, like I said, it was quite a leap for us to go from a model-based implied volatility to the ver fair value of variance swap. Uh, and it took quite a bit of going back and forth. The first formula that they proposed to us was actually only four out of the money puts and four out of the money calls equally weighted $100 apart. They didn't think at the time that the exchange was capable of calculating it based on every item on the button, every item. They didn't think that we could do that calculation. Uh, they also wanted us to ditch this idea that we had with the original fix where it was a trading day implied volatility as opposed to a calendar day implied volatility. Um, so when we made the switch from OEX to SPX, our, our uh, fair variance is actually a calendar day number, a 30 calendar day number. Opposed to 22 trading day implied uh, trading day implied volatility like we had with the original OEX, um, we relaunched the index in September 2003 with a new methodology, and by March of 2004 we got approval for uh, futures from the CFTC uh, to trade on our new futures exchange, the CBOE futures exchange. So at the same time as we were developing the index, a futures product, we also started a new exchange uh, with a completely new trade engine uh, for a future exchange. Uh, two years later, after that, we were able to get approval from the SEC to trade cash settled options on the index. Uh, and in, in the United States, there are two different regulators, CFTC and the SEC. CFTC is mainly dealing with commodities, SEC is mainly de dealing with securities. We actually had to get an exemption from the SEC and the CFTC to allow a cash settled futures contract on the VIX to trade a CFTC regulated product and a cash settled securities options product to trade on the CBOE. Um, and we got that uh, in 2004, right before we launched the, the future, but it took a while for the SEC to approve our product filing for the cash settled options. So they were launched two years later, in uh, February 2006. If you look at the volume growth of the futures relative to the options, it was much slower for the futures. And, um, you know, I can't give you a definitive answer as to why that is, but I think that us starting a brand new futures exchange at the same time that we're launching a brand new product had a lot to do with it because a lot of the people that were interested in trading into this product, uh, the fixed futures, weren't connected to CFE. Nobody had done any of the, the work to write to our trading system for CFE. Uh, we didn't have anybody who was a member of the exchange yet, so we were doing all of this at the same time. Um, and then the next point on the slide that I have there that, that's been very important in terms of developing liquidity for the VIX has been the, obviously the launch of the ETN that happened in 2009. And you, you can see from a chart later in the slide that it had a huge impact on the liquidity that you see in VIX futures. So, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about an intuition about the formula. Obviously, the path on there is Black-Scholes, 
and that's traditionally how people thought about volatility in the option space, right? Is I had an option pricing model, and I had a, a price of an option, and I said, okay, here's the price of the option, what volatility makes that price fair? And that's the implied volatility that everybody quoted, and before 1987, it was pretty much the same volatility no matter what the strike was. After 1987, you know, you started thinking about this idea of skew, and, you know, there was a different implied volatility dependent on what the strike was, at least in equities, uh, after 1987. So, in 93, while we weren't using black shoals, we were doing very, something very much similar, we were just using a binomial model. Um, the new formula, this isn't actually the VIX formula, this is uh, portion of it that actually is just basically the uh, fair variance for uh, 30 days on the S&P 500. It's our, basically our interpretation of the formula that appears in more than you ever want to know about variance swaps, the, the same type of uh, arguments. Uh, it's just the delta K over K squared weighting that you see in there. And um, the intuition on the formula that always seemed to help me think about what it is that we were doing, why I could take this portfolio of auto money puts and calls and expect it to replicate variance or, or even to, to be a measure of volatility as opposed to implied volatility is this idea that I can create a portfolio of options that has a constant dollar gain. Um, and I borrowed a chart from a friend of mine three different option portfolios um, with different ways to show what their dollar gamut is. Um, uh, the three that he chose were constant, constantly weighted, one over the strike and one over the strike squared. And obviously the, the blue line shows the one over the strike squared and, and how it has a constant sensitivity to, to dollar gamut. And um, what's important to, to, to that portfolio of options is, is this idea that if I have a portfolio that has a constant dollar gamma, and I were to look at my gamma P&L from Delta Hedging, that portfolio of options, it's proportional to the, the square of return, or the variance of the underlying asset. In this case, the S&P 500. So, in my mind, that's kind of a very easy way to think about it. Basically, if you look at Black Scholes and you say Black Scholes is how I price an option based on a replicating portfolio. The formula that we're using for VIX is how I'm pricing volatility or variance based on a replicating portfolio of options. And that replicating portfolio of options is something that's giving me a constant dollar gain. And when I delta hedge that, that's going to give me something proportional to the variance of the 500. And that's why that price, that volatility, is a good price for, for variance. Marcello actually foreshadowed my presentation a little bit when he started talking in the panel about um, some of the characteristics of VIX that give an interest to people. A lot of people are interested in using it as a trading tool um, in a portfolio context. And the two important ones in my mind at least are this idea that it has a very persistent negative correlation to global equity indexes. Um, he, he, he was right, I do the same calculation and you know correlation to the S&P 500, it's uh, averages about uh, negative 86, right, negative 0.86. Um, the, the, the second one that's important to me that uh, I think he kind of touched on, but um, is even bigger in my mind, is this idea that um, the returns uh, of the VIX are actually convex to equity market returns. That means that, I, what I mean to say is that, you know, for down moves in the 500, the VIX reacts very sharply, more so than it does to up moves. And uh, it's actually very quick to react to down moves. So um, those types of things, uh, the persistent negative correlation and the convexity of its returns to the market, um, make it very interesting to people in terms of hedging or uh, you know, in a Markowitz context uh, uh, of a diversification. Obviously, Martello made the point that you don't want to hold VIX because you can't trade the asset, you've got to buy the future, and there's contango there that you're paying all the time. Uh, so, since we've done the VIX in uh, 
2003, we've, had, we've seen a, a bunch of copycat type products. We've done many of them ourselves. Um, pretty much every equity index in the United States has a, has a, a VIX associated with it. At least the top three for us are the NASDAQ, BXN, and the BXD, which is the Dow and the RBX. But we've been applied it to uh, other markets, to, you know, emerging markets, ETF, we use the options on that. To, to calculate a VIX, and we also use the uh, Brazil ETF, EWZ. We've done it on gold, we've done it on oil. We're doing it with one of the presenters here on interest rates in terms of the VXTYM and the SRVX. Um, there have been other equities, you know, global equity indexes that it's been done on. The CME actually uses it now with commodity options to do oil and uh, VIX ETFs as well. They have futures to trade on the, on the uh, CME based on those indexes. And uh, we're actually working on doing it with currencies as well. So uh, this slide I just put together to kind of give you an idea of what I mean when I, I say the correlation is so important. Um, uh, equity index line show an average correlation right around 85% um, between the global equity indexes to the SPX. Uh, and you can see the black line at the bottom is actually the correlation of the S&P to the VIX. And you can see how persistent that negative correlation has been since 1992. Uh, I threw in a, a correlation of the S&P to a hedge fund uh, index as well to give you an idea that there are times in the market and there are environments in the market where a lot of the risk assets, the correlations tend to go to one. Um, and during those times are the times when the correlation of the VIX is its strongest and the VIX behaves in, in a way that makes it a, a, a useful hedging tool or a trading tool for people. The, the second chart up there, I actually wanted to make uh, an additional point. Um, that's the correlation of the VIX. Um, to various equity indexes, global equity indexes, including the S&P 500, all the way to the right. And you can see the negative correlation is pretty persistent across global equity indexes as well. Uh, the, the, the point that I really want to make on that slide, though, is if I can put together a volatility index on other equity indexes using their option prices, like, say, B stocks or B FTSE, or even one to the Cosby, there's a positive correlation amongst equity falls as well, right? So um, the, the VIX maintains that negative correlation, but if you were to list a product like, say, on V-stocks, the, the V-stocks is very highly correlated to the VIX, and the term structures behave in a similar manner. <coughs> This was a slide I put together to kind of illustrate the idea of the convexity of the VIX and how it's useful in, in, in the tail versus hedging idea. What I did was I took 22-day simple returns from 1992 to February of 2014, and I plotted the uh, simple return of the VIX versus the simple return of the S&P 500. And you can see that there's this very asymmetric pattern uh, to the returns. And, the VIX in, in down moves in the S&P 500, which is the left side of the graph, has a very positive uh, correlation that results in a, a strong move, upward move in the VIX. Uh, and this idea that you have this negative correlation uh, between the VIX and the SPX with this strong convexity is what's driving everybody's interest in I. In, in, in developing some type of tail hedge, hedge portfolio using VIX options or VIX futures. One of the other things that, um, at least uh, in terms of variant swaps, was a pretty prominent reason for people using them and is something that gets talked about a lot in relation to the VIX as well, is this, you know, this volatility risk premium how persistent it is across time. Um, I know that when uh, 
the VXX was brought on and it quickly uh, gained assets under management that led it to have a vague exposure that exceeded that of the open interest of VIX futures. Um, a lot of people talk about the idea that the VXX was actually um, affecting the term structure of VIX futures and thus in some way affecting the, the term structure of volatility of the S&P 500. And whenever anybody raised that idea with me, I, I thought it was kind of hard to justify given the fact that that risk premium has remained <coughs> persistent through time and it remains, uh, it, at least in the front run, remains uh, about what it's always been. The term structure of S&P implied volatility hasn't changed much. Um, but this idea that there is this volatility of the and has a lot of implications for the trading of mixed futures and options that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, another thing that um, people need to be aware of when, when you're trading at least the VIX or trading volatility through the, the use of the VIX is this idea of mean reversion. I'm not entirely comfortable with it because I'm not sure what the VIX mean reverts to. I think of it more in terms of volatility environments. Uh, so when you have a high volatility environment, as the example I have here is a term structure of the VIX that I actually took from a website from CBOE. And this is the term structure of the VIX for August 11th of 2011. And you can see that rather than being in, in a futures parlance, what might be term contained, this is actually a backwardation where there's a downward sloping term structure of implied volatility. And based on that chart, you think that the, the level that the VIX mean reverts to is somewhere around 30. The historical average VIX level since 2004 has been somewhere around 20.16. In a low volatility environment, you're going to see something like the chart below from February 13th of this year, um, where the term structure is actually upward sloping. And that one actually, when you have a low ball environment, it tends to look very much like it mean reverts to what that historical average has been. But in a high volatility environment, that average where we're mean reverting to is going to look quite a bit different and is usually somewhere north of 30. So like everybody probably knows and said earlier, uh, the VIX isn't an asset that you can trade. You know, uh, the some amount of cash plus the cash VIX index does not equal the price of a VIX future. It's not a carry market. Um, and the VIX future is basically how you're going to get an exposure to the VIX index through selling, cash selling. So um, there's this idea uh, that is very similar to what you see in interest rates, where if I have a spot curve of interest rates, I can calculate a four interest rate. Um, while the arithmetic isn't the exact same, the idea is similar. And where I have a spot volatility term structure, I can create a forward volatility term structure from it because the variance is additive, right? And the, the, the forward volatility that you get from that needs to be adjusted for, for convexity because you're taking a square root in there. But there have been ways to do that. The uh, second point that I want to make on the slide is right now there are 34 exchange traded products that are volatility based and they have assets of about three and a half billion as of the end of the last year. Uh, so this was a, a slide that I prepared to talk about how, how you come up with this idea of forward variance and, and working from the spot curve. <coughs> I said I take the term structure data from a website we maintain on, uh, at CBOE. And basically, just because variances are added to the forward variance is essentially a, a time-weighted average of uh, the longer dated variance less uh, the um, shorter dated variance. And um, there's a, you know, because of convexity, it's not a direct relationship. It's not like I can take the square root of the four variance and that should be the fair value of the base. So what I've done in this slide is I actually, from uh, since they were listed in 2004 to present, I took the square root of the four variance and plotted it over versus the front month fixed futures price, and I got a correlation of about. Uh, I'm sorry. 
of about 98%. So ultimately, so the supply and demand is determining the price of it, but it has a very strong correlation to the term structure of the S&P 500 and the variance. This is a page of Tom Bloomberg that actually does the same thing um, through a formula that Bruno de Pere and Bruno came up with. And the only point I want to make about this slide real quick is they have a real nice feature on there where the column that's labeled volatility of VIX is actually an implied number where he's making the convexity adjustment to equate the fair value price to the actual observed VIX futures price. And you can see the, the volatility of the VIX that would equate it to. And it's interesting to compare those numbers to the uh, implied levels that you get from VIX options. And they're applying the same thing as the volatility of the corresponding VIX future. Um, another thing that I talk about a lot, and I think people should be very uh, aware of when they're trading VIX for the, the, the future for the options, is the settlement. There's a cash settlement product. VIX doesn't exist. It's a number from a formula, so we have to determine what the settlement value is going to be. There's cash VIX that you see if you type in VIX on Bloomberg and hit index show is going to be a number that's based on the midpoints of S&P option prices. Uh, at settlement, we're actually using traded prices for option trades that occur during, during an opening auction on the Wednesday that uh, we settle the VIX. And we use that settlement value for both. And that can be different than what the midpoint value is that you observe on that day. Um, I did this chart to kind of give you an idea of that. Uh, the one on the left is the settlement from January of this year. And uh, the red dot there is our, our, our settlement price. And the blue line is the midpoint VIX. And you can see from Tuesday close to Wednesday open, the, the VIX actually traded down a little bit with the S&P being up. And our settlement was below that. If you compare that to the, the red line, which is the VIX futures price on the day before, the VIX future was trading at a premium to cash. And the next day, we actually settled at a discount to it. And what I equate that to is us crossing the bid-ask spread in the SPX options, right? So what was happening is, is while we were calculating a cash mix based on the midpoint and the future, we're pricing like we were going to trade those options the next morning at the, near the offer. What actually happened is, is as the imbalance occurred, we traded those options closer to the bid. So we crossed that volatility spread in SPX options on that morning. And that dislocation that people see at settlement leads to a lot of questions about why it is that. Uh, the slide on the right is actually just giving you an idea of how much volume we're trading on the opening settlement. So you'll see us trade anywhere from 100,000 to 250,000 options um, and about 10 million vega. Uh, this is the composer. This is just a slide that I put together that shows you the, the, the exchange traded notes that are out there. I put the VSAX ones in there as well. Uh, None of these, like I said, none of these products are linked to spot bids, right? They all gain their exposure to, to, to VIX through some combination of the VIX futures or VIX options. Uh, most of them roll before you get to settlement, so they don't have the issue of the cash settlement. They've all rolled through. But they do have an issue because of contango of something that uh, people have taken to call the roll down, basically. And it's where they, 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 there's a decay in the price of VXX that's associated with the cost of maintaining a long future. One other interesting thing to you note, know, I think I mentioned it before earlier, is that historically, especially around 2010 and 2011, if you were to add up the big exposure of these types of funds and compare it to the open interest of VIX futures, the exposure that you gained through these funds actually exceeded the, the open interest, the vague exposure of the open interest of VIX futures. Uh, I guess I could probably skip this one since I'm short on time, but what I was doing here is giving you an idea of how you can go through and do that calculation with the VXX, and um, this one is just uh, for February uh, 21st of this year, and basically I, I showed that, you know, the, the asset under management of the VXX equated to about 51 million mega in uh, March 14th VIX futures, whereas our open interest was actually about 177 million mega. So our volume has grown such that we actually, in terms of Exposure on an average daily volume basis and open interest exceed what you're seeing in the VXX. This is a, a slide that shows that, but you can see from 2009 there how much vague exposure is, it, it is grown in VIX futures products and options. 
This one's kind of hard to see, but it was an idea where I was trying to give you what the typical spread width is in the in the VIX and what size what size you could expect to see at those spread widths. Um, one of the points I want to make is you're talking about trading something 10 basis points wide in volatility terms for a million and a half acre. That's pretty good size, a 10, 10 basis point wide. If you're going to a typical variant swap market, you'd see 10 million vega at about 60 cents wide. That's pretty much the average daily volume over the counter variant swaps on the S&P 500. And this is the last slide where I was just talking about the idea that why people actually are interested in trading with products. And obviously it's the convexity of the returns to the S&P 500 and it's persistent negative correlation. The, the, the VXX, nobody should think of it as an investment product, it's more like a trading tool. It's not a long-term tool that you would buy and hold for obvious reasons because of the contango and the term structure. So um, you need to be aware of that and the cost of the roll down. Um, some other things that people are using it for and, and, and the ones that actually make a lot of sense are the idea that they generate alpha using the VIX products. And that's basically trying to take advantage of what that term structure looks like. In various environments, uh, there's also an options corollary um, that is the idea that there's a variance risk premium in, in VIX options as well, where the implied volatility VIX options tend to, to outstrip what actually is realized in the VIX future. A little over. Ask for questions. It was uh, it's really interesting. So we have time for a uh, question. Andrea Lorato, from Horizon Capital. In the first part of your speech, uh, you argued that uh, negative correlation of this with uh, equity indices uh, would make it uh, a suitable instrument for trading capital. For a simple, let's say, normal portfolio manager who manages uh, uh, a normal fund, uh, mutual fund uh, in, in Europe or in the US. Um, I tend not to agree with it because uh, I think that uh, if you buy a simple uh, uh, put option or you just switch to cash, then you have a, a more certain result and you, you are not suffering a very variable negative correlation which the VIX have, has, and also you are not suffering the decay which you just mentioned uh, uh, now. So I, I tend to believe that uh, this is an instrument more uh, suitable for uh, um, proprietary traders uh, with uh, large uh, option uh, portfolios or complex uh, uh, structures which uh, they have to hedge rather than for a simple fund manager who are just, is just trying to uh, hedge his or her portfolio composed of a very simple uh, equity exposures. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I didn't get into a lot of detail about how people use uh, VIX products in terms of a tail hedge, but they're actually taking advantage of some of the properties or characteristics of VIX to do that, right? So, um, you can imagine um, scenarios in terms of a, of a tail hedge with the VIX where um, you're taking advantage of the fact that um, the skew for the VIX looks much different than a regular equity index option skew, right? Um, more uh, the skew on uh, on an S and P 500 option basically looks where the out of the money puts have higher implied volatilities than the out of money calls, right? VIX it's re reverse, right? So call spreads become a very effective tool then for somebody who's going to look to use VIX for tail risk hedging. The other thing that happens is that VIX options don't decay as fast as S&P 500 options. Um, and those are two of the things that I think they cite when they say that it's very useful in terms of tail risk hedging. I didn't go into a lot of detail on it because I really don't talk about strategies. I, I work for the exchange. I can just tell you what I've seen written about it um, and not really recommend it. Join me in thanking our speaker. Thank you, John.